Welcome to a rather unusual episode of Second Opinion, the reviews show here on the Nexus. It's unusual for a few different reasons. Number one being that it's way off schedule. Uh, I was pretty sick over the last two weeks and did not have the energy to uh, record an episode. Um, You probably can still hear it in my voice uh, quite a bit. It's also unusual because, well, I'm your host, Ian R. Buck, but I don't have anybody else with me today. Usually, on second opinion, we try to have at least two people on the episode, two opinions, and I honestly wasn't able to find anybody else uh, who has been using Android 8 for long enough to review it with me. Usually, Ryan Rampersad is my go-to for that because he is just as enthusiastic about Android as I am and, and has you know always had the latest and greatest of, of Google's flagship phones. But this year, he was seduced by the dark side. He bought a Samsung phone, and so he hasn't had Android 8 on his main phone for, for you know, the entire time that it's been out. Um, so I guess it's, it's just me. We'll see how this goes. This episode is also pretty special because every year when we review Android, the new version of Android, that marks our new year anniversary for the show because we started two years ago when we reviewed Android 6.0. Uh, let's see, that would have been... Marshmallow, yep. And so I would like to talk a little bit about uh, how the show's been going over the last year, but I'm not going to do that here, because I don't want to waste anybody's time. Uh, So I'll go do that in the fringe of this episode, which should be the fringe number 450. So let's talk about Android 8.0. If you want to find the show notes for this episode, complete with timestamps for all of the different topics that I'm going to be covering, uh, go to thenexus.tv slash SO30. Again, that's thenexus.tv slash SO30. So in Android 8.0, let's uh, let's start right up at the top with the notifications. Notifications have gotten quite a few improvements and kind of overhauls in the new version of Android. It's Everything's been organized by different categories, and these categories are actually placed on the screen in order of which ones are, are like most important, right? So you have major ongoing notifications for stuff that your phone is currently doing, like media playback or like maps navigation or stuff like that. People to people notifications would come under the uh, underneath those. So that's like messaging things, you know, when when other people in your life are directly sending you stuff. General notifications go below that. And then uh, the adorably named by the way notifications uh, are all the way at the bottom. And the by the way notifications are the ones that are kind of like grayed out a little bit. And they only take up just, you know, a little bit of like one line of text. And the by the way notifications actually don't create icons up in the notification tray when you haven't pulled down any notifications. So they're, they're, it's a really nice category because it kind of gets rid of a lot of these notifications that you don't need to care about right away until you you know have kind of committed yourself to reading through a few notifications by pulling down the 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 whole tray another thing to note is that the major ongoing category are of of notifications are encouraged to have bold background colors which is something that google has kind of done in the past mainly with their google maps navigation you know with the the bright green background now they're encouraging any app that wants to portray a major ongoing notification to have some sort of like bold background kind of thing and they're actually implementing this directly for most media players by taking some of the major colors from the album art of whatever's currently playing extracting that and making a nice like kind of color palette for the uh, notification itself based on what the colors are in the in the album art it's it looks really really cool it's a great effect i encourage you to go and like at least find some screenshots of what this looks like because it's really really cool they are also kind of being more intentional about 
giving the the user information about what the phone is doing at all times, right? Any processes that are going on in the background have to have some sort of visual aspect that will alert the user that, that you know, something's going on. This used to be just be like on an app-by-app app basis that developers would implement this kind of thing. But now the system itself, Android, has a built-in notification that just says an app is running in the background and it'll tell you which app it'll if you tap on it it'll bring you to like the battery information about that app to tell you exactly how much battery life it's been using and stuff i think it's a really good idea for that kind of thing to be implemented but i i really really hate the implementation of it because like for example on my phone I have a Pebble watch, right? And so the companion app for the Pebble is literally always running. And so it always gives me the an app is running in the background notification, despite the fact that the Pebble app actually gives me a notification as well to tell me that it is still running. So the implementation here is not perfect. And I already found like an article um, on XDA developers about how to get rid of the app is running in the background notification. I actually didn't go with any of the suggestions in that article. I went with uh, a slightly different thing. So the, the, the suggestions that they were giving in the article all took advantage of another new feature in Android 8, which is snoozing notifications, um, which is a really, really cool concept where you can uh, instead of like swiping away a notification entirely and you know having it be gone forever if you swipe it part of the way off of the screen in addition to that gear icon you'll also get a little clock icon and if you tap on that it will let you snooze the notification for a certain amount of time so it's like it's like getting rid of the notification and then a certain amount of time later that you specify the notification will come back, right? And it's it's very, very similar to the concept of, like, snoozing messages in Inbox, which is, you know, Gmail's, like, kind of fancy new interface that they actually introduced, like, three years ago or whatever. But it, it's a little bit more limited, though, than the snoozing that you can do in inbox because in inbox you can do like really cool things like snoozing it until like a certain time tomorrow or next week or you can snooze it until you get to a certain place and i think it would be really really cool to have like that level of granularity in the snoozing notifications system wide on android so it's it's a cool concept getting there good start but um i think it needs to be you know it they need to give us more options before it's really super useful so so most of the um suggestions from xda developers about getting rid of the app is running in the background notification involve using another app sometimes like you know tasker or you know some some other like custom built app that would basically just like snooze the app is running in the background notification for an indefinite amount of time for just like basically forever the the other new feature in Android 8 that relates to notifications that I actually used to make the app is running in the background notification less annoying is notification channels. So notification channels is a feature where apps can specify different categories for different notifications. And and then if they do that, then the user can set different priority levels for each of those different categories. So for example, let's say that you have a podcast listening app that you use. It might have different channels for like the playback notification itself for a notification about new episodes, uh, a notification for like uh, we're downloading new about a, you know a whole batch of new episodes kind of thing, and so you can you can specify like those different categories might have different priority levels, right? So basically, like you could relegate some of them to like the by the way category. And you'll never have to see like the icon of it up in the notification tray, and it'll be all the way at the bottom grayed out uh, when you pull down the notification tray. And so that's basically what I did for the app is running in the background notification. I went into the notification settings for Android system, and Android system, thankfully, uh, implements their own notification channels feature. So I was able to take that particular notification and just relegate it down to the by the way section. Now, of course, notification channels is one of those things that like it's it, it's true usefulness is only going to be realized once 
app developers start building their apps with Android 8 in mind, which is going to take a little while because Android 8 just came out. And most, unfortunately, most developers don't pay attention to a new version of Android uh, until after it's come out, even though they have plenty of time when it's in beta to go and play around with the uh, the new features. And then the last notification-related thing that they introduced is notification dots on the home screen icons. So now you, you can like long press on a an, an icon an app icon on your home screen and see the notifications that are currently, you know, listed in the uh, in the Android system notification tray for that app and you can actually interact with them exactly as you could in the uh, in the in the notification tray, you can like swipe them away, and it'll get rid of them from the Android notification tray. You can tap on them to open them up, etc. Now, if you pull down the notification tray and then keep pulling farther, you'll get to the quick settings. Of course, there's a few few changes here to the quick settings. We now have concrete visual cues about which icons are going to be toggles and which ones are going to expand menus. Yeah, it was a problem before because most users don't spend enough time with their phones to kind of memorize like which ones of the quick settings are going to be like, you know, if if I tap on uh, the Wi-Fi, is it going to turn off my Wi-Fi or is it going to take me to my Wi-Fi settings and let me like change which network I'm connected to kind of thing. So now you have like an actual kind of drop down menu icon for the case where you want to go and mess with the settings and then you can you know tap on the the big icon for the uh, Wi-Fi to actually turn it on or off. So it's it's there, there's no more ambiguity, which is good. The the change does bring with it a slight annoyance for me, especially, um, and I I think this is probably pretty specific to me because I, I don't know that anybody else uses the do not disturb mode uh, as heavily as I do. But for me, like I love using do not disturb, like the the scheduled version of do not disturb, to put my phone into alarms only mode for thirty minutes because I love taking. 25-minute naps in the middle of the day after I have finished teaching all of my classes. Um, I just kind of, you know, sneak off to the staff lounge. I sit down in this one really comfy chair that's in there and start up like a, uh, a YouTube video of just some white noise. And uh, and I put my phone into Do Not Disturb for 30 minutes. It used to take me, I, I just had to pull down the notification tray, tap on do not disturb, and like 95% of the time, it remembered my settings from the last time I tapped on it, which was just, you know, put it into do not disturb for 30 minutes. Nowadays, I have to pull down the notification tray, pull down the quick settings, tap on the drop down menu for do not disturb mode, and then change it from like, you know, until I turn this off to 30 minutes. So now it takes me, you know, like, like, five or six extra actions on screen to get to the setting that I want, which is, yeah, pretty annoying for me, but uh, I don't expect that any other, uh, many other, like, users will encounter that kind of thing. The other thing that I am a little bit less than enthusiastic about with the quick settings is that they went from, like, a dark gray theme for the, the quick settings to a white theme. I'm, I'm a huge, huge fan of dark themes in my on my phones, and um, and so I'm I'm really happy that on the Pixel 2 that I just bought, they actually have a setting where or a feature where if you set yourself a really dark wallpaper, it'll actually change the theme of the quick settings to be like a dark background, which is really cool, but is actually not a feature of Android 8 because I tried that same thing out on my Nexus 5X and the quick settings stayed as like a white background. So that's unfortunate. Oh well. By the way, speaking of the Nexus 5X, uh, this was kind of an unusual rollout of Android 8.0, if, if I'm remembering the past correctly, because I'm, I'm really used to new versions of Android coming out when Google has, like, brand new hardware coming out, right? And then that brand new hardware becomes, like, the first phone that comes out with this version of Android. But this year, like, Android 8 came out way back in August... On the day of the eclipse, August 21st, they they did like a big publicity stunt with that, I guess, because like the letter O kind of looks like a sun with like a ring around it or whatever. And so so like that's when Android 8 
traditionally or officially launched. And then I always like love to play the game of, okay, which of my Nexus buddies, which of my Pixel buddies, you know, are going to get the over the air update first, you know, and, and who's going to capitulate and, you know, go and like enroll their phone into the, uh, into the beta. But like nobody who I knew was getting the Android 8 update. It wasn't, it didn't seem to be rolling out to anybody. And so eventually I got like, I think I, I made it like, most of the way through September before I realized that, like, wait a minute, nothing's happening. And so I went and enrolled in the beta just so I could, you know, like, have enough time to play around with it uh, in order to record a, a review of it. But, uh, yeah, eventually, eventually, I think it did start coming out on the Nexus 5Xs because uh, Betsy got it. But, uh, but it took quite a while. So that's, that's anyway, that's my uh, little aside about how weird Android 8 launch was. Let's talk about the settings. So they, they've done a huge rearrange of the settings app and this is actually a lot bigger than most of the other rearrangements that they've done in the past this time they have merged tons and tons of different categories down into into many many fewer i think they have like like less than half the number of major categories in the settings app than they did before I personally have been having a pretty hard time finding things within my first month of using Android 8, but fortunately they have like a search bar right there, so I'm able to usually search for the setting that I'm looking for and find it without many problems. Another nice thing that they're doing to help people find things is they're actually allowing settings to show up in multiple different places. So if, you know, it if it would make sense for it to show up in one place but also in another place, you can likely find it in both places and and you don't have to worry too much. They also have finally added, finally finally finally, an official way for users to add ringtones to their phones there of course you know being android there has always been a way to add additional ringtones to your phone but you had to know like exactly which folder in the file system to put it in before that you needed to know how to access the file system right which most uh, users don't know how to do nowadays in android 8.0 you just have to go to the settings and there's a button for adding a new ringtone and then you just have to hunt down like the mp3 file that you have for it probably in like google drive or um, i suppose you could probably select it from like the downloads folder or whatever Let's talk about emoji. We've got a completely redesigned set of emojis in Android 8.0. This isn't just, you know, they're they're adding a new a new emoji to, you know, update to the latest version of Unicode, but they have taken every single emoji that that uh, that was on Android and they have completely redrawn them. I am conflicted about it. I liked what Okay, so so lots and lots of people when looking at the old like Android icon set or emoji set, they always focused on the blob people, right? Oh, they're such weird shapes. They're such weird, you know, like what are they? They're they're not they're really abstract. They don't look like people. They just look like blobs. Okay. That's not what I focused on when I was looking on the, at those emoji. What I always focused on was, oh man, they're so nice and flat. And by that I mean like, you know, they don't have like gradients. They don't have drop shadows. They, you know, I grew up and by grew up, I mean I went to college during a period of time when, like, mostly flat design was very popular. It was the future, right? We were moving away from skeuomorphisms, from all of these, like, gradients and, like, you know, f- faux leather, like, looking, you know, from, from, like, radio buttons that look like they were actually from, like, a radio. We, we were moving away from all that crap and uh, and moving into a more, like... Yes, you're on a computer. It can just look like a digital interface that, like, you know, is its own thing, right? That's okay. And so I always liked the the flatness of the old Android emoji set. The new emoji set has given up that flatness for a a gradient that goes kind of from top to bottom on most of the uh, emojis, usually fading from, I think, dark on the top to kind of lighter on the bottom. And they also have uh, added kind of a, a ring around, like an outline around all of the emojis that is kind of a like a, a complementary 
shade of the same color that the that the that the main color of the emoji is and that that outline is actually a really nice touch because it makes it so that the emoji is like readable is viewable no matter what background it's placed on but yeah so i'm i'm not a huge fan of the gradientness of the new emoji set but i'm a fan of most of the rest of what they did and and the rest of what they did was like they they made it so that all of the faces have kind of like a consistent shape they're all facing in the same direction right and this goes all the way from like the human faces to the animal faces and everything the the other you know like the animals that aren't just a face that have kind of like a shape to their body they all have a a similar like you know their bodies are all facing in the same direction etc stuff like that so so for the most part it's it's a good redesign i just man i wish that we could keep that mostly flat design oh well and speaking of uh adding new emoji they this one is uh let's see they they've updated to support unicode 5.0 is that what we're up to now i'm not sure but they uh they added 69 uh new emoji her her there is one really cool thing that Google is doing on the emoji front, and that is they've introduced a, a thing called Emoji Compat, which is short for Emoji Compatible, I would assume. It is a, a thing that is going to be distributed via Google Play services and will work with, uh, I believe it's back to Android 4.4. So... If, if you are an app developer and you know that, like, sometimes people send emojis, you know, or, like, the, the, the app is going to try to display emojis that, like, not every version of Android has on them, you can, like, basically import Emoji Compat into your app and any emojis that are not available from the the version of Android that your app is running on, it'll just load those emojis in from Google Play services, which is really cool. So now Google Play services is actually like a font provider for apps. And it is going to be a little bit of a mixed bag because like you can imagine that that you know older version of of Android that still have the old emoji set, they're going to be displaying newer emojis from the new emoji set, right? So, like, the user is going to see very different styles of emojis depending on, you know, like, basically when the emoji was was added to Unicode, um, which is kind of funny. Unless, like, the app developer decides to show all of the emojis from, like, the new emoji set. But then, like, you've got one app on your phone that's showing totally different emojis than the rest of the apps. Oh, wait, that's already a problem. Thanks, Facebook Messenger. Ugh. Let's move on to the home screen, the launcher. Google is starting up a new thing called Adaptive Icons, which is where app developers are going to, instead of submitting just a single like SVG for their app icon, they submit two different images. They submit a foreground image and a background image. And then the launcher, when it's displaying all these these images, it chooses like what shape cutout it wants to use for the background. And then it just centers the foreground image on top of that background. So this was kind of designed to alleviate the problem of like all of these different OEMs love to have like different design types for their like icon sets right so when when samsung skins android they they have like you know these these like squircles instead of uh instead of actual you know like circles as their icon uh shapes or whatever but like most app developers don't target that right they just have whatever shape their app is their, their app icon is and so you get like this kind of you know, if you're if you're on a Google device, some apps are going to look like they fit in. If you're on a Samsung device, you're going to have like the system apps from Samsung that look like they, you know, fit nicely together, but like the rest of the apps won't. Yada yada. So this is kind of Google's way of like allowing anybody's style to to fit in nicely. I 
don't really like that a lot of my icons now look like they just have dinner plates behind them. I I dislike that approach so much that I actually have gone and downloaded like the old icons for a ton of my apps and and I manually change them in uh, in Action Launcher to <laughs> to be back the way they were before because like I don't know as as much as like uh, Google loves to talk about like having a consistent, you know, like background shape for all of these icons. I'm like, you know, I I was totally okay with the way it was before, where all of the app icons were totally different shapes on on my screen. Uh, that wasn't a problem for me. I actually liked it because it it you know gave each of the apps like a you know it, it let them express their own personality uh, in a way that that like iOS never has, where they every single app icon has to be the exact same shape and it all felt very stuffy and uniform so that's like i don't know how do yeah google's kind of yeah go, going away from from my preferences for for icons but luckily you know we, we're still on android and i can still just manually change app icons whenever i want to some of the app icons that uh implement the the new like adaptive icon thing look really cool though like the the google maps one i think is probably the best example because the background image that it uses is not just like a solid color it is the like the kind of streets layer of the google maps icon and so then the foreground image is just like the the g and the the red little pinpoint icon for for google maps um so that's that's a that's a really cool implementation of it actually i I like it when they when when the app icons like do it really well i don't like it when they do the dinner plate approach widgets have always been a really cool thing on android but it's it's been pretty tough to communicate to a user you know like that there are widgets available from a particular app you just had to kind of like rely on the user to be curious enough to like long press on an empty space on their home screen and just like scroll through the list of all of the widgets that are available in android 8 apps can now like surface widgets from within the app so for example if you have your contacts app open and you are looking at a particular person's like contact information you can click on the uh, overflow menu the three dots menu and one of the options in there is add this contact to your home screen as you know as like a, a quick call widget or whatever and uh and so then it it like pops up with the widget itself and then when you long press on that it brings you back to the home screen and you can just like drag the widget to where you want it to go on the home screen which is pretty nifty one of the big new features in android 8 that they talked about actually back at uh, google io and and got everybody real excited for was quick text selection and this was a, this is a feature where you know when you're like long pressing on text to to highlight it usually with the uh, purpose of like copying it and then pasting it somewhere else most of the times when you're doing that it it like you're you're trying to copy kind of a group of text that goes together for some reason you know such as like you're trying to copy an address or a phone number or a URL or something like that right and Google or Google. Wow. Uh, Android can now detect when you are long pressing on a part of, you know, something that is is a, a, a larger complete set of text like that. And it'll default to highlighting all of that all at once for you. And then in addition to like the copy paste, uh, you know, etc. options, it'll give you um, a lot of times a, an extra like do you want to open it in this app option? You know, so for example, if you long press on an address, it'll give you the option of like, do you just want to open up this address in Google Maps so that you can like get directions to it or whatever? Um, and then you can just, you know, tap on that and say, yeah, take me there. In practice, I I haven't seen it working a whole lot. I haven't like thoroughly tried to test it, but I haven't noticed it actually being all that helpful i have noticed like the chrome button popping up for for urls a few times that's been pretty nice but i guess i mean i i guess i don't end up long pressing on like phone numbers and stuff very often the thing that i like copy the most often is the shrug emoticon so i guess if if like ooh, if they could detect 
the entire shrug emoticon as one uh, block of text that goes together. That'd be fantastic. But yeah, it's 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 a feature that's there. You might notice it every once in a while, but it's it's not like life changing the way that they portrayed it. I think uh, back in June. Now, something that is probably uh, pretty life changing is the new password manager system in Android. So up until now. You know, Google has had like the the password manager that is built into Chrome, and that was always synchronized between the different Chrome devices that you are logged into, including your Android phone. But the passwords that it autofilled were only like it could only autofill them in Chrome, right? And so you could never copy those and like paste them into, for example, you know, like I couldn't like copy my Facebook password and paste it into the Facebook app. So now there's an actual password manager and autofill system like built into Android and it can synchronize all of the passwords that are, you know, you probably already have stored in Chrome and makes them available across all Android apps. And when I when I saw this, I kind of chuckled to myself because a couple of years ago, you know, I started using like a third party password manager basically because I was fed up with the fact that I couldn't like autofill my passwords in in all of the apps that are on my phone. Right. And so I was like, oh, well, this this new feature is actually useless to me. No, it actually is useful because it does provide a framework for third third party password managers to hook into in order to have them autofill the passwords into apps and like the storage for the passwords is still like up to that third party password manager it's just that android is doing all of the detecting for you know when you are seeing like text fields in an app that seem to be username and password text fields and that's and that's really really useful because currently my my third party password manager uses like one of the accessibility settings or whatever it presents itself as like an accessibility app so that it can constantly monitor like what text fields are on my screen which i believe is a, a bit of a battery drain um, so if we can just let like android system deal with that perfect excellent Let's talk a little bit about some changes in Android 8 that are going to improve security. Apps can now only request your location once every 30 minutes in the background. There is now a proper way for apps to create floating UI that doesn't abuse the system alert window. So this is going to take a little bit of explanation. So I'm sure that everybody is familiar with the way that like the Facebook Messenger app is probably the most well-known example of this, but like apps that that take themselves and create like little bubbles, right, that float on top of other apps. Uh, I think the Facebook Messenger app calls them like chat heads or whatever. Those have never actually been like an officially supported feature on Android. They always used... A, a a thing called the system alert window which is literally supposed only supposed to be like used for like emergency situations where like you need to get some information to the user urgently put it on top of whatever else is going on right um and the system alert window was something that was built into android 1.0 and for some reason they made it available like publicly for any app that's installed to push stuff to it um they probably shouldn't have made it that public but it it was and so people used it and uh and so yeah so now google is building in an actual supported way for apps to create like floating stuff like the like the chat heads the bubbles and everything um and so this is going to allow them in the future to kind of uh, close down access to the system alert window, um, which is definitely important because like malicious apps will a lot of times use that uh, system alert window to like to to push stuff on top of the screen, even on top of like the lock screen um, and, you know, kind of freak out the user and, uh, you know, like demand ransoms or whatever from them. Um, so this is going to improve security uh, by a lot once uh, once once like Facebook Messenger has actually started implementing like the new proper way to create floating UI and Google shuts down uh, access to system alert window. 
Google Play Protect is, um, I mean, there, there's not actually any like new security features in Google Play Protect, um, but it, it now shows up in a lot more places than it did before. Um, and Google Play Protect is like the, that green shield logo icon thing um, that, that basically is Google's way of saying like, yes, we're doing antivirus work. Like, please don't worry about it too much and yeah so i I think they started putting google play protect branding uh in the play store um like they would put put the logo up above uh your list of like apps that have updates available for them you know to reassure you that like yes we've scanned all these apps we're we're you know really sure that there's like nothing wrong with them etc um so the that that logo now shows up uh, in like the settings app as well as in the Play Store, um, it it uh, shows up like when you start downloading a brand new app. Um, it you know it tells you like yeah we've scanned this etc. I think when you when you download even when you like sideload an app onto your phone, um, I think it'll it'll like compare that app to the database of, of apps that like uh, Google has scanned before and it'll tell you, you know, whether or not it's been scanned. And actually it does default to like uploading the app itself. If you're side loading something to Google uh, and then Google will scan it and, you know, like let you know if it's a, you know, malicious app or not. Speaking of side loading, they did a little bit of a change to the way that permissions work for side loading. Um, so it used to be that like, um, you could only install apps from the Play Store until you, like, you know, tried to install an APK for the first time. And then um, you would have to go into the settings and tell it, like, allow me to, to install um, apps from unknown sources. Um, and and that was just, like, one giant checkbox for everything, right? Um now, when you are installing something from an unknown source... Um, you actually approve on a source by source basis which sor- which like which sources are are can allow side loading um and so this is nice because like you know most of the apps that i'm going to be side loading i'm doing that from uh the amazon app store right because like sometimes deals are better there or like you know they have versions of a- amazon video that you know aren't available on uh, the play store um and so, so like it would be useful for for me to be able to allow just the a- Amazon App Store to install new apps, um, but like not allow other apps to do that. Um, the unfortunate thing about this is that like in order to install the Amazon App Store onto my phone, I have to download the Amazon App Store from Chrome, which means that I have to approve Chrome as a source that can sideload apps. And once I've approved Chrome as a source of apps, like any APK that like downloads itself through Chrome could theoretically be installed without, you know, you you see what I'm saying? So like I guess I guess I could go and like disapprove Chrome after I have installed the Amazon App Store, but, like, most people aren't going to think of that. So I I feel like it's kind of a moot point um, because, like, yeah, Chrome is the very first place that you have to install something from unless you somehow, hmm, I wonder what what source it would uh, claim something is from if I just, like, loaded it off of an, uh, a thumb drive. Hmm, I'll have to go try that out. Anyway, um, Verified Boot will no longer boot an OS that has been downgraded. Um, so certain types of attacks that uh, usually involve like somebody stealing your phone and then um, trying to you know break into it um, would involve like uh, installing a version of the operating system that's older uh, because like older versions of Android didn't have uh, as much security as newer versions, of course. Um, and so if you manage to install an older version of the operating system without like erasing all of the um user's data then you might be able to get at the data um but now the the um, verified boot will no longer allow itself to be booted uh if the os is older than the version that it should be apps are now much more limited on how they can identify the device itself um google is recommending that 
developers now use the advertising ID um, to identify the device instead of using any like hardware specific stuff because the uh, the advertising ID gets kind of like reset uh, whenever the the phone is like factory reset kind of thing. Um, so just a little bit more yeah security on that end. Um, kernel access is now much more limited. Um, web view has been sandboxed. Um, and, uh, when you are going to enable developer options on a, on an Android phone, it'll now ask for your device password, uh, before it lets you do that. Um, so that's nice. There's a few features in Android 8 that I would definitely categorize as finally, uh, most of these are things that they have either been like talking about for years and years. Some of them like showed up in beta versions of Android, but then didn't make it into like the final version. Um, some of them, uh, have appeared on other categories of Android, um, but haven't appeared on like phones yet. Um, yeah. So let's talk about those picture in picture mode. Yay! Um, I love being able to like pull up uh, Google Navig or Google Maps navigation, and then like hit the home button and go to another app to do something real quick, but still see the um, the the navigation going uh, in a little you know rectangular window uh, on top of whatever else is going on. Um, picture in picture, of course, was kind of designed with like video playback in mind um and so most people are going to think of like using this with youtube um it what does work with youtube if you are a youtube red subscriber i find it rather strange that they like because because i okay i understand why youtube red uh like has the background play feature as you know behind the paywall right um because it, otherwise they wouldn't be able to like show you ads as nearly as effectively um if you were able to just like you know not look at it um but like picture in picture mode you're still seeing the the video feed so i don't i don't know exactly what's the problem there um i suppose that it's possible that like the technical impl implementation of picture in picture mode um dictates that like anything that allows picture in picture must also allow like background play or something like that but i don't i you know i don't know um it is what it is um you'd, you'd also like you know so so since like youtube isn't going to do it for for most people isn't going to use picture in picture mode for most people um what other video apps do we have we got netflix uh netflix doesn't um support it yet i tested that um amazon video don't hold your breath like amazon doesn't uh implement new features uh very fast especially on android because you know they hate google's guts um so yeah picture in picture um i think most people are only going to see it on google maps for a while which is kind of funny um but it's super useful on google maps trust me night mode is also finally here um it's 2017 november and i finally have a phone that supports night mode that's super nice um, night mode just being like, you know, the, the yellow shifting uh, of the screen. And also, we now, uh, Android now supports 90% uh, of printers in the world without any plugins. So that's always been one thing that is like super weirded me out about uh, looking around in like the settings on an Android device is like, all right, printers, for some reason I have this HP plugin there. I don't own any HP printers. Why do I need that? You know? Um, but, uh, now, now Google has partnered with whatever big printer, like partnership conglomerate thingy, uh, to support most of the world's, uh, commercially available printers. Um, so that's super rad. The, Easter egg on Android 8.0 is uh, this kind of like creepy octopus that you can drag around. Um, and I guess that uh, this particular one is they, they put it there to test out like some some like new physics engine that they're that they're trying out in Android. Um, and it's a physics engine that isn't going to be for like gaming, which is what I traditionally think of physics engines as being. But it's like it's going to be a physics engine that is meant for the user interface itself. Um, so like doing things like, uh, you know, when you over drag, like drag, you know, like dragging down too far to like refresh kind of thing, you know, and having like a slight bounce back or whatever. Um, 
scrolling f- momentum right you know so so the developers just have to like set a certain amount of uh friction and then you know like the the phone the system just does all the calculations for it um so like each each app won't have to calculate that kind of thing on their own it's pretty cool um bluetooth 5 support comes in android 8.0 um rescue party is a new feature where like if android detects that your current build of android is failing um it will go through like a series of steps to try and recover itself um and each step gets like kind of more and more aggressive about what kinds of things you know what caches it's like clearing and you know which modes it's restarting into um and the They haven't publicly told us, like, what the different steps are that it's going through, but the final step is that it'll boot into recovery mode and then prompt the user to do a factory reset on the device. So, um... Hopefully that can save a few people's butts because, like, uh, most users aren't going to know what kinds of, like, uh, troubleshooting steps they can go through to, to try and recover a device. Um, Android Go is, uh, is, I mean, it's, you're not going to see Android Go on an Android, most Android 8 phones, um, but Android Go is like a kind of a pared down version of Android that's built for really low end phones. Um, specifically they're targeting the developing world. So low memory phones, uh, between 512 megabytes of Ram and one gigabyte of Ram. Um, and it, it, does a lot of like UI changes and um, a few like structural changes uh, that not only take into account the fact that like the phone itself is going to be pretty low end, you know, with, with not very much memory available, but also um, usually uh, in the developing world, the data caps are also like quite a bit stricter. Um, They're much lower than like, you know, the, the cellular data plans that, uh, that we would expect in like the U S. And, uh, and there's also um, going to be a bunch of like apps that are built specifically to go on Android go. Um, And so that, so Android go like Android eight is the first version of Android that has an Android go version that is built, you know, associated with it. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, so we'll be seeing Android go for, uh, phones coming out, uh, sometime next year, I think in 2018. Um, so we haven't seen that yet, but, uh, coming in the future. And then finally, I want to talk about updates, updates to Android. Um, because, as as much as I love being on like the cutting edge here, you know, I love talking about like the newest version of Android as soon as it comes out. I I've that it's one of the things that I always emphasize is owning a phone that is going to have the newest version of Android come out to it. As much as I love all of that, I have to admit that like it it most users are not going to see the newest version of Android until it's like two versions old, which is just sad. But Google is actually doing something about this for once. Like, like in, and they're not just like going like, hey, OEMs, please play nice. They're actually putting together a technical solution to this problem. And they call it Project Treble. So what Project Treble does is it separates the like higher end of Android from the lower end, the hardware end, right? Because this is one of the the big things that has prevented Android phones from having like long-term software support. It's the fact that the chip manufacturers don't support their their hardware with driver updates for more than two years usually. And I and I, I first became aware of this problem, actually, when I was talking to Ryan Rampersad about the NVIDIA Shield tablet, and I remarked that, like, you know, it's amazing. My NVIDIA Shield tablet has had support for more major versions of Android than the Nexus 5 did. And the Nexus 5, of course, you know, is, like, straight from Google. It's supposed to be getting these updates straight from Google. Why isn't Google supporting the Nexus 5 for as long as NVIDIA is supporting the NVIDIA Shield tablet. And Ryan looked at me with kind of a little twinkle in his eye because he realized that he was going to be able to teach me something new that I didn't know yet. Um, And he was like, it's because Qualcomm 
doesn't support their chips with driver updates for more than two years. Whereas the NVIDIA Shield tablet, the driver updates come straight from NVIDIA. And because NVIDIA wants this tablet and, you know, other devices that run on the Tegra chipset, um, they want those devices to, to have software support for longer. They actually come out with driver updates for longer. And actually, that's that's one thing that, like, NVIDIA has going for it a lot is is their reputation of coming out with, with new driver updates for their hardware, you know. But yeah, so driver updates, crucial usually for um for software updates to be able to get pushed out um but project treble is uh google's effort to kind of separate out those two different aspects so now um there's going to be like kind of almost you could almost think of them as like different buckets right that that the uh that the code is going to fit into um the um, the the chip manufacturer is going to have a particular bucket, right, where their um, their their drivers have to you know work with with their hardware, and then that presents itself to the rest of Android via a very very specific API, right? Um, and so then the version of Android that um, you know is based on like the AOSP, um, the Android Open Source Project, um, you know that that is the version of Android that is being updated periodically, um, that is getting the security updates, you know, that monthly um, stuff like that. That that version of Android doesn't actually have to worry as much about which version of the uh, drivers are on the hardware because as long as the API version for those two to be able to communicate with each other, um, as long as that API version is still compatible, um, then it sh- you should be able to just keep updating Android um, for as long as you want to. Um, and so this is going to have like quite a few different consequences. One, it's going to make it um, a lot easier for the OEMs, the uh, the the device manufacturers, to um, like come out with with version with with updates for uh, their their Android devices uh, in a timely manner. Um, there is going to be a little bit of an obstacle still with like you know the OEMs have to like test their the the custom like skinning that they do on top of Android a lot of times. Um, any cellular carriers that have their grubby little fingers on the software of the phone, you know, they're going to be doing, they're going to have to do testing on their, uh, their custom apps and whatever. Um, by the way, never ever buy your phone through your carrier, please buy it unlocked so that you can, uh, get, you know, updates directly from your, um, device manufacturers. Um, but this is also going to make it, um, possible for like, you to replace all of the OEM customizations with third-party ROMs because um, any Android uh, open source project build should, you know, that is built for Treble should work on any Treble device. Um, I haven't, you know, personally tested this yet, but like this, this could be an exciting new world where like even if you buy uh you know a Sam- like so so one of the things that's always prevented me from wanting to buy a Samsung phone is the fact that I know that like Samsung uh you know skins the heck out of of Android um they don't come out with uh the updates nearly as as frequently as uh as you know Google brings it to their own devices um and and also you know it's it's a heck of a lot harder uh to like um just install a custom rom on top of or you know wipe wipe the phone and and install a custom rom on on a samsung phone um as it is for like a nexus or a pixel right it's a lot easier to do on a nexus or a pixel um but it should be like in this new project treble world, it should be just as easy to do it with one of them as with another, um, no matter who the, uh, the manufacturer is, no matter, um, you know, you just have to have an unlocked bootloader and then you should be able to like, um, install whatever ROMs you want. Um, and it'll make it a lot easier for the communities that create and maintain different ROMs to do their work because instead of having to create a different um, build 
for each individual device that they want to have their ROM available on. They just have to do one build, and then it will work on any device that was built for Treble. Um, and that's going to be every single device that that comes out with Android 8.0 or above is going to support um, Treble. Um, but upgrading devices, it's going to be optional. Um, so far, we only know about the original Pixel um, that that is, you know, for sure going to to um, have trouble on it. As, you know, when when it uh, upgrades to Android eight, um, yeah, we'll just we'll just we'll have to test it on a on a on a phone by phone basis, I guess, for all of the other ones. Um, I'm not sure if. Uh, if apps that like you know want to make sure that they are running on an approved version of Android um, will work on like third party ROMs in this new Treble world, you know. So I'm thinking of like um, Netflix or Android Pay that like you know kind of d- don't allow themselves to run uh, if they detect that you have like installed Lineage OS on your phone or whatever. Um, uh, yeah, I, I I don't know like how how they're going to react to having a uh, having a different, um, you know, build on, on a project trouble device. Um, but yeah, project trouble, probably the biggest, most significant like change to Android that we've had in years. Um, and most users are never, ever going to know that it's there. They're not going to realize, you know, the, this profound change. Um, but hopefully they see the benefit, like, hopefully they get to experience the benefits of it in the form of, like, timely OS updates from their, um, uh, from, from their manufacturers at the very least. Um, the other cool thing that they've got going on the update side of thing nowadays is uh, streaming updates. Um, so some some users, uh, you know, when they when they get like the notification that they've got an Android uh, system update available, they'll click on that button and it'll try to download it, but then it'll tell them like, "Hey, you're almost out of space. I can't download the update." Um, and that's always been because uh, when it downloads the update it puts it onto the user's partition um, uh, before it actually, like, copies over this new update um, onto the, like, boot partition uh, when, you know, when you restart the device and, and uh, you know, install the, uh, the update. Um, but uh, using the new, like, AB partition uh, separation that they introduced last year with Android 7.0... Um, the when when there's a new update available uh instead of downloading that update to the user partition um android can just directly write that update to the the um boot partition that is not being used which is really really cool um and so so it just like uh, needs to use a, f- a few kilobytes of data on the user uh, partition for just like metadata or whatever. Um, and so, so users shouldn't see uh, users shouldn't see that kind of like message uh, popping up anymore. Um, the ironic thing is that uh, this is only available on like you know fairly new devices that have that AB partition like setup um and i think that most of the phones that have that ab partition set up uh have like enough storage space on them that it probably wasn't a concern for those users in the first place but um i don't know it's it's a it's it's a cool technical like solution for for that problem oh boy all right so that was um android 8 um by the way if you are uh still interested in hearing more about uh about all of the goodies that are available in this newest version of Android. Um, Ars Technica ha- always, every year, has like a great, in-depth, thorough analysis of of everything that uh, that's that came out in the new version. And I always use uh, I always use their article to make sure that I don't miss anything important uh, when talking about it in uh, in this uh, in this review. Um, so yeah, so you can go and uh, check that out if you want to read more. Um, this has been Second Opinion. Uh, if you want to see, once again, the show notes for this episode, including like uh, um, links to, or the timestamps to each individual section. So if you want to jump back and listen to a particular thing again, um, go and check out those show notes at thenexus.tv slash SO30. 
Um, if you have any feedback for us about uh, this episode, please reach out to us. We are The Nexus. Uh, you can find us on Twitter at The Nexus TV, or you can send us an email at The Nexus TV at gmail.com. Um, if you, you know, have like a brand new phone or device or, you know, you want to review something for us, uh, reach out to us as well. Love to have new guests on the show. Um, and, uh, I have been your host, Ian Arbuck. You can find me on Twitter as Ian Arbuck. Um, and you can find links to other stuff that I make at ianarbuck.com. Thanks for listening. Have a good one.